Um, let's get started. So welcome to Scaling with Apache Spark, or a lesson in unintended consequences. Um, thank you for coming. There are going to be a lot of cat pictures in case the intro slide does not give it away. Um, I'm Holen. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist in case you forget. Um, and I'm a principal software engineer at IBM Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. It's pretty fun. They pay me to work on open source code. Um, so I really like that. And uh, I got to become an Apache Spark committer as of January, which um, is really important to me. I don't know if any of you care, but I was really excited about this. So you all get to hear about that. Um, and I've worked at a bunch of other companies, including one of the big Spark companies, but then just a bunch of other companies doing data and like search type problems. Um, I've co-written a few Spark books. I'll try and get you to buy the ones which pay me better royalties. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, right now, it's mostly just me being really confused about why I live in America. Um, but yeah, uh, the slides from today's talk, um, I put them on this random USB stick, but I don't know where they go. Um, but I'll also put them on SlideShare, and you can check them out over there. Um, and if this is like, an interesting Spark talk, and you want to see more, I have some, some more Spark videos up on YouTube. Um, I think it's fun. Um, and just like as an interlude from, from all of this wonderful tech stuff, I, like, I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm Canadian, I'm on an H-1B visa, um, and I consider myself part of the leather community. And being in America right now, these things feel kind of sad sometimes, um, but also I think part of that is maybe some people don't know people like me. So if you don't know other trans or queer people, like, hi, we're maybe not as scary as the television says, um, and you know not, like, I'm on an H-1B, and like I think I'm quite friendly. I'm not here to steal your jobs, and I'm here to like press the buttons the same as you. I like writing software. I think it's amazing. Um, anyways, uh, we'll go and talk about happy things, like the people who pay me money. Um, <laughs> So IBM pays me money, it's amazing, and they pay a bunch of other people money to work on related problems. Um, there's like about 50 developers and a bunch of designers, um, and we all just work on open source Spark and related projects like system ML and other things like that that are open source Apache projects. Uh, we have a lobby, it has a lot of green in it. Um, oh right, and we have this, this um, graph that goes up and to the right. I like this graph, it means I keep getting paid. It's the amount of stuff we've contributed to Spark, and so I will continue to make sure that graph goes up and to the right. Um, Otherwise, I'll be looking for a new job. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of my assumptions about who you all are. Uh, we're going to look at some of Spark's sort of core abstractions. Um, and then we're going to start talking about sort of some of the design decisions that we made in Spark a few years ago and how they impact different things that you might want to do in Spark. Um, and this is, this is a bit of a different format than I normally try and present this material in, so I, I would love your feedback. I'll try and get some of it by just looking and seeing how many people are falling asleep. Um, but if you don't fall asleep and you have thoughts about it at the end, I would love to know. Um, and if you fall asleep, like please don't snore too much. Um, it would be appreciated. So I'm hoping you're all nice folk. Um, if you mind pictures of cats, hopefully the first slide like cued you in that it was time to leave. Um, how many people are actively using Spark or, or know Spark to some degree? OK, that's good. How many people have no idea what the hell Spark is? OK, four. Probably more people. OK, six, six. Um, how many people like are just like sort of checking out Spark, but like aren't don't consider themselves actively using? OK, awesome. That's good. So hopefully this talk doesn't scare you away from becoming one of those people actively using Spark. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the sort of like skeletons we have hidden in the closet that we don't normally like mention, because it turns out when you're like, yeah, I murdered six people and they live in my basement, um, people get a little bit like worried about using your software. Um, so hopefully you can see that like they were murdered for good reasons. Um, and this analogy is not working. So we're going to switch to something else. And and uh, we're going to switch back to Pokemon. So maybe you know it'll be the six Pokemon that we've got hidden in our closet, um, and that'll be happier. 
Um, so for the people that are like completely new to Spark, it's amazing. Don't let this talk dissuade you from it. Um, it's this really awesome general purpose distributed system. Um, I think people come to Spark in two ways. One is they're using MapReduce and they're like, I've got like six hours to kill. Maybe I should figure out if there's something better than MapReduce. And then they're like, oh, hey, look, I found this thing called Spark. I can probably learn how to use it before my MapReduce job finishes. Um, and then, you know, we get a new Spark user. Um, the other one is like they're a scientist, they're playing around in Python, it's great, they just got this grant, and now they have too much data and it's not opening in Pandas or R or whatever tool it is they want to use anymore. And then they're like, uh, I, I still want to kind of use Pandas. Um, and like if I buy a bigger machine, it still didn't work. I bought like three of those, and now I don't have a grant. Um, but it's okay. We can stitch those three machines together for you and make it work. Um, or you can, you know, run it on AWS. Um, there's sort of two core abstractions in Spark, and we're going to look at both of them today. Um, RDDs are resilient distributed data sets. Um, if you're completely new to Spark, you can think of it as this magical distributed collection which totally works and totally definitely is not six gremlins hiding in my closet. Um, and our work and our data is both automatically distributed across our cluster, um, which is really important, right? Like, not only can we have lots of data, our work on this data is going to be distributed, so it can go kind of fast. Um, they're really awesome. They have a bunch of properties we'll talk about. Uh, but one of, the, one of the important ones is the resilient part of this RDD. Um, in distributed systems, failures are kind of like a first class citizen. We can't pretend that our hardware works because when I have 100 nodes, the chances that I'm going to get a failure is getting pretty close to one, right? Uh, even if I bought some fancy machines from my employer, that 100 node cluster is probably going to experience a failure. So RDDs are resilient, and they can recover from failure, and they do this using some magic we'll talk about. Um, data frames are also resilient. They're, they're wonderful. Um, if you're coming from Python or R, your expectations when you hear the word data frame is like up here, and your expectations for Spark data frames need to be like down about here. Um, so essentially, I, I love data frames. They're amazing. We can do a lot of things with them, but we can't do all of the things that you're used to doing in, in Pandas with Spark data frames. You'll have to write a lot of sort of glue code to make it work. Um, but they, they provide a slightly different execution model, and we'll talk about about these two models. Um, but let's jump on to what the different pieces of Spark are. For, for the people who are new, um, I think it's really cool that we have all of these different things that you can do in Spark, and I don't have to install like six different systems, like in the traditional Hadoop space. I'd have a separate system to do streaming, I'd have another separate system to do my machine learning, and I'd have to stitch them together. Um, and I think this is pretty cool, and this is my kind of like vaguely salesy one, um, I, even though it's free open source software. Uh, you can definitely tell that it's not an IBM sales pitch. We have no designers um, uh, working on my slides. <laughs> but OK, let's focus on one of the first design decisions we made in Spark. Um, and that is that RDDs and data frames and all of our sort of distributed collections in Spark are going to be lazy. And I don't necessarily mean lazy like a panda. Um, I just mean when we ask it to do something, it doesn't really. Um, it just keeps track of all of the things that we ask it to do so that when we get to the point where we would notice that it hasn't done any of its work, right? It's, it's, like, it's like your 16-year-old. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You asked me to do my homework. I got this. I got this. Don't worry, Dad. Don't worry. Don't worry. And then, like, you know, you see them at, like, 5 o'clock in the morning drinking coffee, and you're like, hey, why are you doing your homework now? Well, it's due at 6, you know? Um, and so this is, this is the Spark uh, model. We, we keep track of all the things we're asked to do, and we do them as soon as we absolutely have to. And we do this for the same reason your teenager puts this off, is like, maybe I'll get asked to write two essays, and if I think really hard, I can write these two essays kind of at the same time. Um, and like, you know, my English essay and my history essay might look kind of similar, but I'm going to, you know, hope they don't talk. And Spark does the same thing for us, right? It's going to be like, oh, hey, what's up? Um, you asked me to like do a map and then a flat map and then some other things, but I can just like put these all together into one thing. Um, and that's pretty awesome, right? 
Like, uh, for people coming from MapReduce world, uh, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to combine all of your different things together into map tasks. Uh, and you see some really nasty code where it's like, if this, then smear, then smear. And it's just like, it's ugly, right? And in Spark, I can pretend that that's not happening because the computer does it behind my back for me. Um, and so when the ugliness can be hidden from me and I can pretend that I'm working in a nice, purely functional world, life is amazing. And I get to be happy. Um, so what do these plans look like? Right? What, what happens when we ask Spark to do something? It builds up this, if we're working on RDDs, it builds up this thing called a directed acyclic graph. And these are all of the things we asked it to do. And then it got to this point where it had to do like a shuffle. So like we couldn't just compute the data locally on each of the individual executors anymore. And so then we have like what's called a stage boundary. Um, and then it, it keeps, this is still one DAG, but so this is why they're two separate stages. But then it just keeps going with all of the things that it can compute inside of this other stage. And it keeps track of these for us. And it's pretty amazing. This is a really simple graph um, because it's only, it's very linear sort of dependencies. But we could have like, many different things coming together, and we could have many dependencies. Um, if we're working in data frames, instead of being called the DAG, we have this thing. It's called the query plan. Ooh. Um, and that makes you think like fancy Oracle optimizer, or like fancy, sorry, <clears throat> DB2 optimizer. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if my boss ever watches these talks. Um, but anyway, so you think fancy, you know, database engine optimizer. And to some degree, that's actually what we get. So our query plan, uh, we're able to do a lot more sort of cool optimizations. And we'll talk about why we can do some more cool optimizations on the query plan in a little bit. Um, so as someone who occasionally teaches big data classes, I am required to put the word count example in pretty much everything I do. You might have wondered why it's the canonical example, and that's why. There's this licensing requirement. You'll back me up on this, right, man? Come on. We have to put word count in everything, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's a licensing requirement um, from the secret shadowy word count licensing bureau. Um, but so this is you know, pretty simple Python stuff. Um, and I, the, the Spark specific bits, like our map is being called on the RDD rather than like doing map with the Lambda and then the RDD is another parameter. Um, and this is just because we, we need Spark to like intercept the map call. We can't like just treat it as an iterator. We have to use the special Spark map. And our reduce by key is kind of special, but we're gonna, we're gonna really focus on this part. Until we actually get to saving our data out to a file, Spark really hasn't done any work. If our input file, or you know, if our input terabytes of HBase data or whatever system we were using didn't exist, we wouldn't actually know until we got here, right? And that's like terrible for debugging, but it's amazing for performance, right? Because if we loaded our data right away and then we just kind of sat there and then like we asked it to like tokenize it and then we tokenized it right away um, and then like we did the next part and then the next part, like we'd be doing many, many passes over our data and just every one of those passes is kind of expensive. I have to like deserialize everything, load it through, stream it through, and like this way, I can just do this in one like nice little single pass, right? Um, and that's pretty cool. I think it's nice. Um, so the laziness gets us something. But it's important to note that it doesn't get us all the way there, right? In the magical happy land which I live in where my programs just totally work and I don't have to think too hard, I have a whole program optimizer. Unfortunately, Spark's laziness like, isn't a whole program optimizer. It's able to optimize up to the point of an action, but it can't see beyond that action. Um, and so this means that like our laziness gets us really far. Um, we can like not have to focus too much on combining things together, but if we have a bunch of actions that have the same dependencies, we need to help Spark out and tell Spark that it needs to keep the data around for us. Um, otherwise, it will like effectively have to load the data multiple times, and we lose all of the happy benefits of our lazy evaluation. Um, I, another really interesting thing is that this lazy evaluation is actually how Spark achieves resiliency. 
Um, and this is, this is pretty awesome, right? Because what Spark does, instead of writing the data out to three disks on three separate machines, which is so last season, um, we just keep it in memory when we can. But if one of our executors disappears, we're like, oh, no, it's cool. I've got this plan that I built up when I was keeping track of my lazy evaluation. I'm just going to go back to my plan and figure out how to recompute the piece of missing data. And if you're lucky, it can just recompute just that little narrow, tiny slice of the world um, that it lost. And everything will be happy. And you know, um, your job will still finish really quickly, even though you had a node failure. Um, and this is pretty amazing, right? Or at least I think it is. Like, it gives us a very different resilience model than MapReduce or other systems. Um, the, the, the downsides is like debugging is kind of confusing, right? As mentioned, um, if our input data didn't exist, we wouldn't find out about it until we tried to save it out. And if one of those two map or flat map functions was wrong, we wouldn't find out about it until we tried to save the result out. And if we're working in Python, the error messages that we get is essentially something went wrong, um, which is like super useful because um, <clears throat> it's better than just like returning null, but it's not. It's not that useful. Um, Scala people get better error messages. How many, how many Python users are in the house? OK. How many Scala users are in the house? Oh, wow. A lot more Scala users than I was expecting. That's cool. That's cool. Y'all are lucky. You get some nice error messages. But Python users, we friends. We friends. Um, OK. Right, so how do, we, how do we work around this lack of magic inside of reusing our data? Um, it's pretty easy. We can just tell Spark, like, hey, what's up? I need to use this data again. And we just call persist, and we tell it, like, hey, this data is really small. Just keep it in memory. Or, like, this data is really big. Please, like, keep it in memory if you can. But if that doesn't work out, just, like, spill it to disk, and that's going to be OK. Um, and you can even say, like, this data is really big, and it is the result of, like, an eight-hour job. Please save it to two machines just in case. Like, it would be really nice if losing one machine didn't, like, result in recompute for my eight-hour job, right? And if it's a narrow transformation, you're, you're fine. Like, but you, you still might want to do underscore two with an eight-hour job, right? Like, it's probably worth the slight overhead of copying it to a second machine. Um, and, and that can be fun. Does anyone work in a shared cluster environment where like your jobs get preempted? There's like two guys. OK, we'll talk later. Um, OK, so the second like sort of key design part of Spark is partitioning, all right? I said our data was magically distributed. Um, and it turns out that when you write like dot magically distribute, the Scala compiler says, what now? Um, <clears throat> or, you know, type error. Uh, but in Spark, we, we do our distribution by looking at the keys of our data. Uh, or if our data isn't keyed, we treat our values as if it was a key, right? So if we just have input text files, we treat each line as a distinct key. And then we take these things, and we convert them into partition numbers, and then we sort of can split up our partitions on the different machines. Um, and this is really useful, because like without partitioning, we would have all of our data on a single node, and this wouldn't be very useful. But the, there's this catch where our, our partitioning is what we call deterministic. And that means that for every key, I return the same value. Um, and that's pretty good, except for there's this, there's this slight thing. It's called, it's called key skew. Um, key skew to the anti-rescue. Um, so much sadness, so much sadness. So it turns out that pretty much if you've got like totally, if you have things that was generated by like the random RDD generator, you don't have key skew, and that's amazing. If you have other data, you probably have key skew. Especially when you don't think you have key skew, you have key skew. Um, and if the client tells you my data is normally distributed, your client is lying. Um, <laughs> so I have some feelings from a few jobs back. I, Appreciate that they paid the bills, though. Um, but it turns out, like humans, we cluster together in places. Um, data, we null values. Yeah, ninety percent of my records might have a null value in some random column, and if I pivot my data to that column, I might be sending all of those records to the same place because I have this deterministic partitioner. Um, 
this, this key skew and this partitioning effect can mean that if I do something like group by key, it's going to explode. And that's, that's kind of sad. Um, in Spark, group by key is actually really easy to make explode, which is confusing if you're coming from a different system. Um, but even just other things like doing shuffles can have problems in Spark. Um, and we'll, we'll look at sort of how these things can explode and make our lives sad. So if we've got some random input data, um, here I'm looking, so I'm getting kind of tired of being in the software industry, and I've been thinking about opening an artisanal mustache wax shop in San Francisco. Um, but to do that, I really need to know where the people, I mean, your mustache on point. Uh, we'll talk later. Um, but I need to know where the people with mustaches like you live in San Francisco, because I don't want to relocate to Philly. That's too much work. Um, so, and I think I was also maybe considering New York for my artisanal mustache wax shop, which is why I've got this 10031. And so I call my group by key, and then I get this record that is really big, because it turns out there's a lot of hipsters in San Francisco. There's so many hipsters in San Francisco that my computer falls over and I can't figure out where to open my artisanal mustache wax shop, and I keep working in software. Um, which is like, yay, because the mustache wax shop probably wasn't going to go that well. But on the other hand, it's a little sad, because like, I still have to work in software. So maybe, maybe we can do something else. Um, so if I was just interested in computing like a summary statistic, it's much easier to do this safely in Spark. Um, we can use something like reduce by key or aggregate by key. And then what happens is, is instead of making this giant list and just trying to keep it in one place, as we go, Spark will sum up the values for each key on each worker node, or will not necessarily sum, perform whatever aggregation it is you're trying to do. Um, and then it'll do the shuffle of the aggregates, and it'll combine the aggregates. And this is much safer. Unless you have like hundreds of thousands of partitions, you're going to be fine. And if you have hundreds of thousands of partitions, you need a support contract from Cloudera, uh, sorry, from IBM. Um, <coughs> oh, God damn it. Uh, you need a support contract from a Hadoop vendor anyways. Um, and IBM Big Insights is the best. I'm pretty sure that's what our product is called. Um, right. So. You can replace your group by key with reduce by key or aggregate by key. But that, that only really works if I'm computing some type of aggregate statistic, right? Maybe I actually need to start sending these targeted mails to these really you know, exciting, high-value mustache clients, right? Um, so I'm like, OK, OK. So I can't group them together by key, but I can sort them. And then I can start going through and like picking out the ones who are in, in the right partitions. Um, so we can take the same data, and we can shuffle it, and we still get sadness. Um, because our deterministic partitioner says, hey, this is a key. All of that data has to go here. Right? And that's very sad, because once again, there are too many hipsters in San Francisco. I can't compute this data safely. Now, you might have noticed that our input data is just fine, right? It's not sorted, mind you, but like our input data was clearly able to be loaded, and Spark didn't fail. And so this is because Spark only needs a partitioner if you do something like a sort by or a sh and essentially anything which triggers a, sh a shuffle operation. So sorts, joins, group bys, anything which is like operating on a per key basis essentially effectively results in a shuffle. Not like 100% of the time, but for the purposes of thinking about artisanal mustache wax shops close enough. Um, and so here our, our thing fails, and I'm sad because I don't know where to send my targeted advertisements, and my mustache wax shop just does not get the customers coming through, and I return to working in software again. Um, but it's OK. In my next return to software, I figure out the solution, and I'm just going to put some junk on the end of my key, and it's going to kind of work out, right? Um, and this is kind of a sad solution, right? It's it's sad. I have some extra junk on the end of my key. It's not very pretty. But it works, and I can send my targeted mustache wax advertisements to, to people in San Francisco. Um, if you don't believe me, here's an example on literally kilobytes of data that I did on the plane once. Um, the font size is small enough that you pretty much have to trust me. Um, but this number is bigger than the number that's going to be on the next slide. And uh, yeah. Woo! 
Ooh. Um, so it decreased by about a fourth, and this is because when we do reduce by key instead of group by key, um, in this case I'm computing like an average or a sum of some type, um, we are able to not only does our job succeed, it transfers less data over the network because it's able to do the reduction locally on each of the different computers I've got and then shuffle the data across the network um, rather than shuffling the data and then trying to combine it. So why, do, why does our Spark partitioner have to be deterministic, right? Like, we could have partitioning, but if I allowed 94110 to go to two partitions, my jobs could actually succeed, and I wouldn't have to add this extra junk to the end of my key, right? So why do I have this requirement that my partitioner is deterministic? Um, the biggest one is if I'm doing things like joins, if I have a deterministic partitioner, I can actually just, if I have co-located data, it'll be on the same machine, right? That deterministic partitioning is actually really, really useful. I know where I can find a specific key or range of keys, um, and this is, this is incredibly useful, right? I can save a shuffle in the future, and maybe I can save a shuffle with a bigger, more expensive data set. Um, that being said, there is some work looking at trying to make it so that we can allow for non-deterministic partitioning in the cases where a deterministic partitioner literally cannot succeed. Um, and this is, this is a thing, this is one of our, our design decisions that we might fix or improve. Um, the only catch is like figuring out when a deterministic partitioner cannot succeed involves looking at all of your data and knowing how many keys, how many instances you have of each key. Um, so you can do a split. And in sorting right now, we sample the data to do this and it works out pretty well, but I'm not certain that our sampling is gonna be sufficient to, to support really figuring out where we need to do non-deterministic breaks. Uh, it might, it might not. There's a pull request from some person I don't know. But he seems to know what he's doing, um, but I don't know him yet. Uh, okay, cool. So design part three. Um, Spark allows us to have arbitrary functions, right? It's not a database engine. It's not like pandas or something, uh, which isn't a database engine either, right? For the most part, pandas prefers us to not provide arbitrary lambdas, but we can. Um, but Spark, almost all of the things that you could do in early versions of Spark involved you providing an arbitrary lambda expression, right? If you wanted to rekey your data, you didn't say like rekey my data, you said run this function, and then inside of your function you, you specified how to rekey your data. Um, and that's amazing. It's super powerful. It's really great. It means that I can just use my Python or Spar or sorry, Scala knowledge, and like it, it transfers very easily. I don't have to like switch a lot of properties in my head around. There is a downside, though. Looking at JVM bytecode and figuring out what's going on is like black magic, and it's not something anyone that works with me knows how to do, besides this one guy, but he's a little weird. Um, really nice guy, though. Really nice guy, but like we're not letting him touch the optimizer, because um, then we can't read it, and we can barely read it as is. So <clears throat> right now, inside of Spark, all of these operations on RDDs are sort of operating on opaque functions that we can't understand, right? So our optimizer, we can look at the things we've been asked to do, but we can't look at the things you've told us to do inside of your functions. And we can't figure out what's going on. And this limits the kinds of optimizations we can do, right? Like, you might load some data and then like select a subset of the columns that you're interested in, and like if I knew that, I could just load that subset of columns, right? The fastest data to process is data that I never read. Um, but I can't do that, and this makes my optimizer sad. Uh, and so the solution was adding a new API. Uh, or, I mean, solution. <clears throat> I have mixed feelings about this. Okay, so right, here's our bad word count. Um, and this is an example of like, we don't actually know what's happening inside of map values, right? If our optimizer was magic and we were looking at Python bytecode, we could see that you were doing some type of aggregation after your group by key. But because we can't peer inside of the Lambda expression, we can't actually optimize this for you and we can't save you um, from our awesomeness. But it's okay. Data sets are totally going to fix this. Yay! No one believes me. Um, it's okay. So we do a bunch of things in data sets, but I think really the important thing to understand 
is that we allow for what are we call relational style queries and functional style queries. And in our relational queries, you write in a little Spark DSL, um, and it's very similar to writing SQL style relational things. So we've got a filter and a select, and then we have our reduce. Um, but the filter and select are special, right? Because they're this like relational style query, our optimizer can actually look at it and say like, oh, you don't care about the pandas that are sad. You only want to look at the happy pictures. Like, it's OK. I just won't load the sad pandas, which, you know, I mean, I don't want to load sad pandas. That sounds depressing. Um, and then I'm interested in knowing how fuzzy they are. So maybe I'll only load the attributes column, right? Because that's where the fuzziness information is stored. Uh, and then I've got my reduce, and I can't see inside of it, but it's OK. And that's, that's pretty fine. Um, and so this is nice, because we get to intermix these two styles. And when we do the first thing, our optimizer can do so many more awesome things for us. Um, it doesn't always. Sometimes the optimizer, like, essentially has a few too many drinks and then decides to load an entire database anyways. But it might do the right thing. And that, for me, is good enough, um, because I'm pretty lazy. Um, and and the, the other nice thing is we don't have to limit our, our functional queries to the end. right? They can go in the middle. We can have this map function, and we can go from a data set to another data set. And we can do some type of relational queries after our functional transformation. It's more difficult for the optimizer to figure out what's going on, but it can still do some more awesome things for us. Um, and it can be so much faster. Here's an example. Um, big is bad, small is good. Um, so we, we know that group by key is bad because we can't see inside of our functions to, to see what's going on. Um, but even if I rewrote it to use aggregate by key or reduce by key like I told you to, um, it still is actually a little bit slower than the data frame one. Um, and this is because data frames, in addition to like fixing this problem of the optimizer not having enough information, also fixed a bunch of other problems, um, things like using Java serialization. Um, because like when you think space-efficient representation, you don't normally think Java serialization, uh, unless you were thinking XML first. Um, <clears throat> and if you were thinking XML first, then like yeah, Java serialization is an improvement, but it turns out an array buffer is really much better than both of those. Um, and so data frames also fix a bunch of serialization-related things. They make it go much faster. We do special serialization, where we can do certain operations without having to deserialize the data. If you're coming from the Hadoop world, you can think of it as we have a sortable trait on, on our stuff, and it's nice. Um, and that being said, data frames, while they save us from a lot of things, like any new thing, they introduce a new exciting opportunity to fail. Um, or, uh, no, that's not how my boss says it. A new exciting opportunity for advancement. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so essentially, there is a bunch of stuff that doesn't work in data frames super well. Um, if you're trying to do machine learning on top of data frames, you are going to have a very interesting time. Um, especially with your gradient descent or whatever iterative algorithm you want to do, there's some magic incantation you're going to need to steal from the Spark code base. And that's OK. Magic incantations, nothing ever goes wrong with those. Um, OK, cool. So for the Python people in the house, we're going to talk about how PySpark works. Because PySpark works in this extra special way. Actually, wait, are there any C Sharp or R folks in the house? Two? Three. OK, cool. Four, maybe. This still applies to you. Are, are any of you actually C Sharp folk? <gasps> One. Do you work for Microsoft? OK, cool. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So there is actually a C Sharp Spark binding. It's not shipped as part of Spark itself, but it's implemented in a very similar way to how I'm going to talk about how this works. So it's going to apply to you, too. Um, so yeah, Ooh, quick detour. How am I doing on time? Oh, yeah, OK, we're good. So PySpark works by using this thing called Py4j. Py4j is this really, I keep, I keep saying bad things about Py4j, but then afterwards I have to say nice things, because like, 
it is better than any other alternative. It's still just really bad, right? Um, like most software, it's like, wow. I mean, this works, but like, ooh. Um, Pi4j, I'm pretty sure I can accidentally summon Cthulhu um, by including the wrong class path. Um, so be careful. Uh, it is really nice. It lets us call Java code from Python. So on our, work, on our driver program, we use Pi4j to sort of get all of our stuff that we need to get into Scala from Python. But then on our worker programs, we've got like all of this data that we're processing, and we need a way to get it back into the JVM. Um, and so we use pickling because uh, uh, same reason we use Java serialization, right? Um, except it turns out that pickling is a lot slower than Java serialization, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. So we use this thing, it's kind of slow. And then we sprinkle a bit of magic pixie dust on top of this. And then the magic pixie dust probably breaks. Um, but sometimes it works and your job succeeds. So let's, let's look at what our magic pixie dust looks like. Um, so when you're actually running PySpark or like C Sharp Spark, I don't remember whatever they called it, but like when you're running a non-JVM Spark, the general setup is you have a driver program where it's communicating with Py4j or some other similar library, possibly over a Unix socket, and issuing commands to the JVM. And then the JVM takes these things and it ships it over to the workers, and then the workers have JVMs on them. And then they take the little command that they were given and they ship it over to the Python VM or the C Sharp VM. But then all of your data actually lives inside of here. And so we take the data that lives inside of the JVM and we ship it to Python. And then when we're done processing it in Python, we take it to Python and we ship it back. How bad could that be? <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, pretty bad. Um, so we do a lot of things to make sure that the amount of times we copy the data across the wire is minimized. Um, this is actually one of the benefits of the lazy transformations that we were talking about earlier. Um, because Spark is lazy evaluated, when you have your flat map and a map, we're like, ooh, I'm going to put those together. Um, and then inside of PySpark, we put those together. Um, and this is really important, because then we only have to copy the data from the JVM to Python once. And that's kind of expensive. <coughs> Um, yeah, double serialization makes everything expensive. Um, error messages make even less sense. Um, literally, the error message for trying to parse the string incorrectly in word count is about 400 lines in PySpark. Um, and there's this magic incantation you can search for inside of it to find the actual error message. And if you want to watch that, I have a talk on YouTube on how to debug PySpark. It's really depressing. Um, this is the part where, like, for, for you who don't use Spark yet, I, I assure you it's not all sadness. I'm just talking about sadness today. Most of it's happy. Um, but it's OK. Um, if instead of doing our stuff with RDDs, we do them with data frames, um, our optimizer is able to be like, oh, that's amazing. It can understand our, our DSL. When we write our DSL in Python, it actually gets compiled down to JVM bytecode for us. So that our, like, this is the Python overhead, and then we're just doing it here just straight up purely in the JVM, even though we've written our code in Python. Now, naturally, our DSL can't do cool things like call NumPy for us, um, because you know NumPy isn't available in Scala. But our DSL can do a lot of things. And if you're using PySpark, you should really consider doing this. Um, cool. It's a sleepy cat with some coffee. Uh, yeah, so for the people that were new to Spark, um, there's an Apache Spark YouTube channel. Uh, actually, for those of you who aren't new to Spark, it has a lot of really great talks on it, um, mostly from the Databricks conferences. Uh, I have some Spark videos. I think Paco has one of the best introduction to Spark videos that I've seen. Uh, it's a little bit out of date on YouTube for free. If you have a corporate expense account, uh, you can buy it like more nicely done from O'Reilly for $100. Uh, if you don't have a corporate expense account, you can watch it for free on YouTube. Um, it's pretty OK. Uh, if you're actively using Spark, I keep running into people that don't test their Spark code. It makes me really sad. Does anyone work in healthcare? 
Okay, please, for the love of God, test your code. I don't want to die because of software I wrote. That would be really fucking depressing. <laughs> and I would be in one of those fucking engineering textbooks about like how I irradiated myself by accident. Um, so please, test your code. I don't want to be responsible for my own downfall. Or the downfall of other people, too, right? But like, I mostly care about myself and my stuffies. Um, you know, other humans are good, too. Um, yeah, there's some cool resources. Ah, and books. Yay! I'm a co-author of many, but not all of these books, and I receive the highest royalties for high-performance Spark, which is where we're going to focus. Um, uh, if anyone's super new to Spark, I think learning Spark is a great intro. I'm one of the co-authors. Um, if anyone's looking to start in PySpark specifically, Denny Lee and Tomas, I will probably say his last name wrong, so I won't, um, wrote Learning PySpark recently. It's really good. I don't get any money from their book, but I still think it's good. But my book uh, is amazing. And this is the one where there's like, I have less co-authors, so I get more money. So I think you should buy several copies of it. If you have an expense account, it is a great gift for pets. Um, <laughs> because pets do not know how to return things to Amazon for credit. Um, you can buy it from O'Reilly. Uh, if for some reason you don't want to buy a book that doesn't like technically exist yet, um, which is fine. You can go and give me your email address to selectively contact in accordance with local regulations, um, which I have to say because some people in the EU gave me their email address. Um, you can give me your email address, and I'll let you know when it's actually finished, and you can get a paper copy. Um, but if you just want like the online copy, O'Reilly will sell you one today. Um, right now, it's being copy edited, which mostly means the people at O'Reilly are like, I don't think this is a sentence. And like, are you sure this is what you meant to say? I don't think there's actually gremlins living in the computer. And I'm like, it's true. What about if I called the gremlins an allegory? And they're like, it's a tech book. No. Um, so yeah, it's not working out. Um, but I'm hoping it'll be finished soon. And my editor hopes it will be finished very soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have some <laughs> disagreements that I'm looking forward to sorting out. Yes. Mm. Um, and I've got some upcoming talks. Uh, I will be in Chicago tonight if anyone is looking for an excuse to go to Chicago. Um, I will also be in Lisbon. Um, right now, I'm arguing with our immigration lawyers about Barcelona, but I'm pretty sure I can convince them that I'm a Canadian citizen. I don't. <clears throat> Yay, big companies. Um, I will also be at Strata London and something in Israel, um, Scala Days Copenhagen, and Spark Summit West. If you're like actually really interested in Spark, that is probably the conference to go to. It's like very fancy. Um, I used to work for them. I don't work for them anymore, and I still like they still let me come to their conferences and parties. So they're like clearly not that bad people. Um, it's pretty solid. Uh, they actually even helped review some of my books, so like I, I owe them a solid too. Um, so that's pretty much like it for the content that I have prepared. But like, if anyone has questions, I would love questions. Um, this is Bun Bun, um, and this is Boo. They're my stuffed animals. They can't answer that many questions. But if you've got a question about flowers or dog treats, um, they can be my assistants. Does anyone have questions? Or should we just like? go get the conference food and put it in our face holes. Oh, question? Uh, so in Haskell with laziness, we often find we want to kind of force strictness sometimes. Yeah. Is this something which I should feel bad for even asking about in a Spark context? No, it is totally reasonable and delightful question. Um, and the solution to that is you call this thing called count. And count is an action which does pretty much nothing except forcing evaluation. It tells you how many records you have, um, but yeah, the, the overhead of doing that is zero. So actually, not completely true. In Python, the overhead of doing that is 
marginal but close enough to zero. Um, and you can call for each if you actually really want a zero overhead force. Um, but everyone just uses count because the syntax is really fast. So a bunch of people that I know maintain a library called Frameless, which is yeah. on top, which uses sort of shapeless and some other things to try and provide like a like a sort of higher level typed API over Spark. Have you looked at it? And like, what's your feeling about stuff like that? Yeah. So I haven't done a lot of looking at Frameless recently. Um, I think it's cool that people want to do that. Um, Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad that they're doing it, but like, I'm not going to use it. Um, at the end of the day, from where I sit, like, I think it's more useful to provide support to Python users. Um, I, I like. I'm a Scala developer at heart, but I spend most of my time trying to make sure that APIs are usable for Python people, uh, because I think the Scala developers can already access all of our internals and do whatever they need, um, which is which is part of how they make these these wonderful libraries. Um, but I'm focused on the on a different corner of the world, so I'm not super up to date on like that side of the world. Um, is there a lot of work going on today with? Um uh, Apache Arrow? Um, <gasps> feather on the Delightful question. And I did not pay you to ask this question. Um, <clears throat> that is a wonderful question. And the answer is kind of. Um, my coworker, Brian, who was a wonderful person, has an outstanding PR to try and use Arrow um, in a very limited use case uh, to start with. Um, I talk to Wes sometimes. Um, about what it is we need to do to make our projects like happy together. Um, but at the end of the day, um, how do I put this uh, politely? I'm sorry. Uh, damn it, there's a video. Um, <clears throat> I'm really excited about Arrow, but there may be some challenges with finding ways for everyone to get on board and, and get the necessary sign-offs from the project management committee to add Arrow as a hard dependency to Spark. Um, and I could be wrong about that. It might actually end up being really easy, and we'll see it in Spark 2.3. Um, but my guess is it might take a bit longer than it would normally, just because of some hesitation around adopting new libraries. Because Arrow is very new, right? It's like 0 0.2. And like, if you're like a 2.0 product, and you're like taking on a 0 0.2 dependency, that means like it is my job to like make sure that the upgrade path is smooth, and the other people probably do not give a sh uh, do not care <laughs> about my challenges in upgrading. Um, but you know, that's that's just yeah. But wonderful question, thank you. Okay, I think that's it, right? Yeah, okay, cool. We're gonna go get food, and I'm gonna go to an airport. Um, thank you all for having me.